Hi there, I'm Jeremy Krug, and in this video we're going to learn how to determine the oxidation state, or the charge, of any atom in pretty much any compound that you could ever encounter. Now there are some very specific rules that you have to follow in order to do this, but if you follow the rules, you're going to be able to determine the charge of any atom in any compound that you could ever encounter. So if you learned something from this video, please shoot me a thumbs up and leave a comment down there below in those uh, comment sections, and I would really appreciate that. Well, the first rule that you need to know is that elements by themselves always have an oxidation state a charge of zero. So we can just look at pretty much any element like you know zinc metal, uh, iron metal, those are going to be zero. Uh, even uh, diatomic elements like oxygen, you know, still going to be zero. Uh, even if they have polyatomic elements like in the case of phosphorus or sometimes sulfur, still going to be zero. The charge of, of those atoms in any element just by itself is going to be a zero. Now, when you have an ion that's by itself, it's going to take whatever charge it happens to be labeled with. And so this is also, once again, very easy to isolate. That zinc ion has a charge of positive two, and we know that because there's a little plus two right there. Or this iron is a positive three because it says plus three. That oxide is, of course, negative two. That phosphide ion is negative three. If at this point you feel that this is just too easy, well just wait, it does get a little bit harder. Uh, generally speaking, when you're looking at compounds, alkali metals, we're talking about those uh, those elements that are in uh, group one, the far uh, left hand side of the table, those are positive one, and alkaline earth metals are positive two, the ones in the second column of the table. So uh, for example, sodium chloride. This sodium right here is an alkali metal, so it's going to have an oxidation state of plus one. And calcium fluoride. This calcium is an alkaline earth metal, so it has a charge of positive two. And lithium nitride. That lithium is an alkali metal, so it's got a positive one charge. Now, if we know what one of the uh, one of the elements will be in a compound we can use algebra or simple math to figure out the oxidation state of the other element in a binary compound and the reason for that is that all compounds have a total oxidation state of zero and if you encounter a polyatomic ion it has a total oxidation state of whatever its charge is and you can use simple algebra or math to use the oxidation states that you know to solve for the ones that you don't. So what I mean is, in the case of this compound here, sodium chloride, we know that uh, this sodium right here, of course, is a positive one, just like we said earlier. So since this entire compound has to add up to zero, that means that the chloride right here has to be a negative one in its oxidation state. If we try this compound here, calcium fluoride, we said earlier that calcium is plus two. That means that the two fluorides overall have to be negative two. But there are two of them, so we have to divide that negative two, well, in half basically, and that means that each of the fluorides will have a negative one as its oxidation state. So we can use the, the oxidation states that we know to solve for the ones that we don't know. Same thing here. Uh, we have zinc and uh, nitride. Well, you know, you can basically unswap the charges. We know that zinc, when it's an ion, is always plus two. And we have two of those. Actually, we have three of those, excuse me. And so that's a total of plus six. That means that these nitrides have to have a total of negative six between those two. So negative six divided by two would be negative three. So each of the nitrides is a negative three. Of course, you could just unswap those charges and say that that th three means that the nitride's negative three, and this two means that zinc is plus two. You can do that as well. There are a couple different ways to, to solve these. Now, in a compound, oxygen is pretty much always going to be negative two. There is an exception to that. If you see a peroxide, Oxygen in a peroxide is negative one. 
But in all common, uh, in, in, in all honesty, that's not that common. So just uh, be aware that oxygen in a peroxide is negative one, but pretty much you know, 90% of the time, oxygen is going to be a negative two. So like in this case, we know that the oxygen is negative two, and we have three of those. So that gives us a total of negative six. That means that the iron has to, to account for a positive six uh, between those two atoms there. So the only way for that to work is to have two ions of plus three apiece. So that tells us that the oxidation state of iron is plus three. The oxygen, of course, is negative two. We can try carbon dioxide. Now, once again, the oxygen is negative two. And we have two of those, so that gives us, gives us a total of negative four. That means that the carbon, in order to balance that out, has to be positive four. So once again, what you want to do is find the element that is the most obvious and then work backwards from there to solve for the oxidation state of any uh, uh, of those elements that you don't know. Same thing here, dinitrogen tetroxide. Oxygen is, is a minus two, and we have four of those. And that gives us a total of negative eight. Well, that means that these two nitrogens have to have a total of positive eight, if that's the case. So what we do is we divide it by the two, and that's positive four. So that means that each nitrogen has to have a charge of positive four. And so you can see how this works. Use what you know to solve for what you don't know. Uh, generally speaking, hydrogen is going to be positive one when it's bonded to a nonmetal, and that's about uh, probably 95% of the cases that you'll find, maybe even more than that, I don't know. Very rarely or very occasionally, hydrogen will be bonded to a metal in what's called a hydride ion. If that's ever the case, then the hydrogen is going to be a negative one in that case. So let's try this one, HBr. So once again, it's bonded to a nonmetal, so hydrogen is going to have a uh, a positive one charge, which means the bromine has to be negative one in its oxidation state. And we can try this one here, calcium hydride. In this case, the hydrogen is bonded to a metal. So the H would have to be a negative, whoops, a negative one. And we have two of those. So that's a total of negative two. And of course, that means calcium would have to be a positive two, which you probably knew that anyway. So there we can see how to, uh, to, to determine the oxidation states of different substances. Sometimes it's not obvious. Sometimes you don't have um, perhaps one that you can look at, like a sodium or something like that. If the elements are not obvious, focus on the most electronegative atom that's in the compound. You can usually predict that from the periodic table. So for example, if we have carbon tetrabromide, we know that Bromine, that's the most electronegative element there in that compound, it's the farthest right on the table. So it's a halogen, and so it's negative one. So bromine has to have a negative one charge, and there are four of those. And so that's a total of negative four, which tells us that the carbon has to be positive four. So we can figure that out. Let's try nitrogen trifluoride. Well. Once again, of the two here, fluorine is the most electronegative, and so we can predict that from the periodic table. It's in the group 17, so it has a negative one charge. We've got three of them, so that means that we have a total of negative three, which means that nitrogen has to be positive three. Now, you might not have guessed that nitrogen could have a plus three charge, but in this, in this particular compound, it actually does have that oxidation state. How about phosphorus pentachloride? Well, the same idea here. Chlorine is the halogen. It's the most electronegative of the two elements. And so we can predict it from the table. It's a negative one, and there are a whopping five of those. So that means that the five chlorines have a total charge of negative five. And that means that the phosphorus would have to be positive five. And once again, maybe by looking at the periodic table, you would not have guessed phosphorus to be a positive five, but in this particular compound, that is its oxidation state. Now, let's practice here. Let's determine the oxidation state of all atoms in the following species here. So let's try the nitrate uh, 
polyatomic ion. Once again, the idea is use what you know to solve for what you don't know. So we know that oxygen is going to be a negative two. And we really don't know what the nitrogen is going to be. So let's use algebra to figure this out. So nitrogen, we don't know what that is, so let's call it X. And then the three oxygens at negative two apiece would be negative six. And the entire ion adds up to a negative one. This little minus sign right there tells us that. So we can just use algebra to solve for X and see that X equals positive five. And so that means that nitrogen would have to be positive five in this particular uh, substance. How about sodium dichromate? Well, once again, use what you know to solve for what you don't know. We know that sodium is a positive one. We know that oxygen is a negative two. We don't really know about that chromium, do we? It's a transition metal. Those could have all kinds of charges. So let's set up a little algebra problem here. We have two sodiums at plus one apiece, so that's a, that's a plus two. We don't know what the chromium will be, and we have two of those, so let's just call that 2x. And we have seven oxygens at negative two apiece, so let's call that negative 14. And since this is a, a compound, it's going to add up to zero. So now all we have to do is solve for x. So when we simplify that, maybe 2x minus 12 equals zero, and then carry the minus 12 to the other side, and we can see that the x is going to equal positive six. That means that the oxidation state of that chromium right there is actually a positive six. Once again, you might not have guessed that, but chromium can certainly be a positive six. Let's do a little bit more practice here. We're gonna determine the oxidation state of all atoms in the following species. So we'll start with sulfur dioxide. Once again, the key is isolate one element that you're sure of, the one that's the most obvious, and work uh, backwards from there. So we know oxygen looks to be the most obvious one. I'd call that a minus two. And we have two of those. So that's a total of negative four, which means that the sulfur has to be positive four, doesn't it? You can use algebra, you can just eyeball that and see that sulfur has to be positive four. Either way works. How about carbon disulfide? In this one, it's not really obvious uh, either one of those, so let's focus on the most electronegative of those two. The most electronegative would have to be sulfur, so that's the one that we're gonna pinpoint the first. So that sulfur, it's in group 16, those are negative two. So if you wanna use algebra, the carbon, we can call that X, and two of these sulfurs would be negative four, and that of course adds up to zero. So that means that the carbon would have to be a positive four. Once again, you might not have seen that to be obvious, but once you know the rules, you can work the problem and figure out what the oxidation state of any of these atoms would be. Let's try the sulfate polyatomic ion. Once again, it may not be obvious, but looks like the oxygen is the most obvious here. The oxygen is negative two, and we don't know what sulfur is, so let's just call that sulfur uh, X, and since we have four oxygens at negative two apiece, let's call that negative eight. And then the whole thing is going to add up to a negative two because that minus two right there gives us the total charge. So when you solve for X, you'll find that X equals positive six. That means that the sulfur has to have a charge of positive six. Now, let's take this concept of uh, determining oxidation states, and take a look at an example problem. Now, we said in the last video that there are lots of special types of redox reactions that deserve special attention. We know that uh, actually the combustion of hydrocarbons, that is a type of redox reaction. And if you have a hydrocarbon and it's combusted completely in oxygen gas, the products will always be carbon dioxide and water. So if you have this reaction right here, where a sample of uh, methane gas is burned in air, hopefully you will remember from uh, unit one, uh, or actually unit zero of this series anyway, that methane is CH4. And we're burning it in air, so that means we're adding it to O2. And the products, of course, are carbon dioxide and water. So that's how you'd write this. Now, let's 
balance the equation, and we're going to go one step further and determine the oxidation state of all elements in that reaction. So let's start with this methane here, this uh, CH4 on the left. Now if we look at that, we should remember that the most obvious one is the hydrogen. And since uh, it is you know, in a, a compound here, it's going to be a positive one. And there are four of those. So that means that it's going to be a negative four for carbon. You can just uh, pinpoint that just, just as you see it there. Since it's bonded to a, a nonmetal, hydrogen is going to be a plus one. There are four of them. So your carbon has to be negative four. The oxygen over here, it's just a, a plain old element, oxygen gas. So it's going to be zero. And then carbon dioxide, same process here. The oxygen is a minus two. And there are two of those, so it's a minus four. So your carbon has to be plus four. Once again, use what you know to solve for what you don't know. In water, uh, you could probably figure out either of these, but oxygen minus two, so hydrogen has to be positive one once you divide out among those two right there. So these are the oxidation states of all the atoms, all the elements in this uh, reaction. And if you get that, then you can look at this reaction and realize, well, take a look here, carbon's charge is going up. It's going from negative four up to positive four. So when a charge goes up, that's called oxidation, isn't it? So carbon is being oxidized in this process. And then take a look at this. Oxygen, its charge is going down from zero down to negative two. So that means that oxygen is being reduced since this charge is going down. So you can use this concept of determining oxidation state, if you need to, to determine what's being oxidized and reduced in a reaction. I hope you've learned how to determine oxidation state now. If you have, then please go ahead and uh, smash that thumbs up button and I hope to see you on my next video where we're going to jump back to acids and bases and look at those reactions for a brief bit. Thanks for watching.